In March 2020, dedicated educators joined the ranks of health care givers, working twice as hard and as much as four times longer preparing distance lessons for online classes. I salute these tenacious teachers. In this short video, I will give you a taste of the live and or online guest lecture series I've developed in the hopes that it can enhance your programming and provide a window into a pivotal time in cultural history. The 1980s New York City downtown scene changed music, art, film, and fashion forever. Neo-expressionism, graffiti, street art, and varied forms of performance and punk cabaret flourished. It created new and defiant cultural paradigms. For some, acceptance into the pantheon of art stardom brought unprecedented wealth and fame. By sharing images, stories, and context of the moment, I hope to engage students in the core issues and show how many of these concerns, such as gentrification, racism, gender politics, and class conflict continue to resonate today. First, some background. I am an artist, a musician, and a writer with a long and varied career, some might say a checkered one. I was a young painter living and making art in the Lower East Side while teaching in Harlem throughout the decade. The people I met and firsthand experiences I had there are the inspiration for this series. I began writing about these experiences in 2018. In the fall of 2019, I was honored to have my essay, David Vonerovich, Culture Warrior, accepted as a merit paper at the Southeastern College Art Conference in Chattanooga. In February of 2020, I launched my first official tour, giving guest presentations on this subject. My midwinter trip to the College Art Association Conference in Chicago was bookended by guest lectures at Wright State in Dayton and the University of Toledo. I returned to North Carolina buoyant and prepared to expand the endeavor. My timing couldn't have been worse. The COVID-19 pandemic shutdown hit us all at that moment, so I have revamped my presentation, as many of us have, to a virtual one. Take a look at this brief dip into the topic and please reach out if it looks like something that will enhance your programming next semester or beyond. This inquiry promises to expand into many other eras. I arrived in New York City January 1983, smack dab in the middle of the peak of this phenomenally energetic time. I taught art in public schools in Harlem and lived, worked, and exhibited downtown in various galleries that popped up like weeds in those days and I rode the post-punk, post-new wave wave throughout the decade. Art brings money. Money brings gentrification. New York City has now become an exclusive playground for the rich. Yes, things do change. In many ways, the energy of that time was about change, inevitable change in lifestyle, socio-political perspectives, cultural empowerment, and the nature of creativity. The nature of this change is echoed in subsequent developments in many places. Specifically, the process of urban regeneration, spearheaded by intrepid artists, writers, performers, and musicians, tends to become co-opted by investors and speculators. This series dives deeply into that reality. This decade began with the election of Ronald Reagan, partially as a reaction to America's decaying fortunes in the 70s, and ended with the emerging culture wars that became visible nationally around 1990. The artists that I've studied in the last two or three years are folks with whom I've spent time. David Vonerovich served as a powerful engine of cultural change, both ethically and aesthetically. I spent a day with him as his art star began to glow in the spring of 1985. He was at Gracie Mansion Gallery, which was located right across the street from Beulah Land, an art bar where my first solo show was hanging at the time. This location was right near Tompkins Square Park, where a violent riot occurred a few years later when Mayor Koch sent the police in to clear out the homeless squatters. Work from David's Explorations of History show, which sold out, 
was being stored and prepared for shipping. On the floor were materials including images for what would become his Four Elements paintings. The Four Elements series is arguably his finest work and the apogee in his development as a painter. It was during that afternoon I spent with David that I realized I was in the presence of an uncompromising intensity, a force of nature. Fodorovich would be lost to us in 1992 due to the AIDS epidemic. Before his passing, he would become an integral warrior in at least two major battlegrounds. The protests calling for AIDS research funding that would become the ACT UP movement and the Senate hearings calling for the defunding of the National Endowment for the Arts, driven by North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms. Primarily based on conservative cries of obscenity, the most famous works to be targeted were Maplethorpe's homoerotic photos and Andres Serrano's Piss Christ. Also targeted was David's unfinished video, Fire in My Belly, shot in Super 8 at Teotihuacan during a road trip to Mexico, which includes a clip of ants walking over a crucifix. This reactionary outrage reemerged in 2010, 18 years after his death, when it was pulled from an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery called Hide, Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture. The whole thing was taken out of context as Vonerovich had used the image to illustrate the reality of the suffering that AIDS victims experience. It was not designed to attack Catholicism. Such culture wars continue to be waged to this day. Vonerovich had entered the downtown scene as a street artist, first making himself known through a series of on-site photos called Rambo in New York City, echoing a similar period of cultural upheaval, the 1870s Paris Commune which inspired Rimbaud's imagist poems that he called Poesies. His masterpiece, A Season in Hell, emerged from these experiences. As the art scene heated up and some attention began to be paid to the artists living and working in the previously dilapidated Lower East Side, the first major exposure for this milieu occurred at the New York New Wave Show, organized in 1981 at PS1 which is an artist space in Long Island City, Queens, just over the river from Manhattan. This show included many of the soon to become downtown royalty, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Myra Paul, Robert Maplethorpe, Nan Golden, and bona fide stars such as musician Brian Eno and the legendary William S. Burroughs. David was not invited but in his perennially subversive way, he found a spot. Though this story is told in many publications, a detailed version was relayed to me by the critic, curator, and arguably both the creator and destroyer of the legend of the downtown scene, Carlo McCormick, during my visit October 2019. David Wojnarowicz was partly mad scientist, and he applied his gifts to a kind of creative psychoterrorism, which both helped and hindered his career trajectory. When he discovered that he had been left out of the PS1 show, he devised his own inclusion through the live medium of cockabunnies. As stated, David's inclinations tended towards mad science and even science fiction. Somewhere along the way, he discovered that cockroaches could be flash frozen and not die. According to Carlo, this method was employed on the day of the New York New Wave opening at PS1. While the roaches were unconscious, Wojnarowicz attached cotton balls to their rear ends and cut out paper ears to their antenna. Estimates vary, but maybe three dozen were transported in a matchbox by way of subway and released in the offices in the galleries of PS1. Thus was born the legend of the cockabunnies and the antagonistic vision of Wojnarowicz gained visibility. A similar art action occurred when he and his associates dumped bloody cow bones on the steps of the premier modernist gallery in Soho, the Leo Castelli Gallery, to draw attention to elitism and the exploitation in the art market. 
Around the time I met David, he had been commissioned by one of the top collectors of contemporary art in New York City. In addition to being included in the prestigious Whitney Biennial of 1985, he created an installation designed for the children's basement playhouse of this collector's mansion in Manhattan. The top floors were devoted to modernist masters and pop and conceptual artists. David once again felt slighted by being relegated to the basement like a marginalized bad child. He proceeded to bring his neighborhood uptown. Included in the original piece were bits of trash, found objects, and even dog droppings he'd collected, possibly from the famous dog men who roamed the village. This mansion was the Mnuchin Mansion. One of the children who played in the basement was none other than Stephen Mnuchin, Donald Trump's Secretary of Treasury. One wonders if Voinarovich influenced Stephen's political decision-making. As mentioned before, my investigation focuses primarily on the artists I knew. Ongoing studies of Kiki Smith, Martin Wong, Sue Ko, and David Hammonds are in preparation. I spent the most time by far with Hammonds, helping him collect bottle caps for his magnificent piece, Higher Goals, to which I pay homage in one of my paintings. It's called Urban Fox Hunt. Kiki Smith, whose career in my mind best reflects the impact of that decade on the cultural developments that would follow, is the exception. I only met her in passing at random art openings. The more I research this topic, and the more I reflect on those intensely heady days and nights, the more I see evidence that supports my opinion regarding its effect on that which has followed. Further inquiries into the long-term influences of the East Village neighborhood will include Black Mountain College in the 50s and LA's 1990s scene as evidenced by the Helter Skelter Show in 1992 at LA MOCA. I attended that opening. The LA riots followed closely on the heels of that show. This painting behind me was inspired by my experiences during that period. Other relevant investigations include the cross-pollination of the downtown 80s scene with the German neo-expressionist movement of the 70s and 80s, as well as the 90s Young British Artists Movement, or the YBA. My endeavor to bring this history to current art enthusiasts is multifaceted. The processes that played out in that place and that time are definitely recurring in other places and times since then. There's much to learn about how we might help nurture creative communities to survive and hopefully thrive in this process, particularly with respect to such problems as gentrification and egalitarian access to the distribution of art. This is a task that should not be confined to a small, exclusive segment of the population. I would like very much to share this series with you and to have the pleasure of becoming informed as to how your creative community is developing, especially now that COVID has changed everything again. These presentations are designed to be 45 minutes to an hour long PowerPoints. If live in-person seminars are not possible, online platforms that allow interaction are certainly available. Videos are being recorded as well for the pieces that I'm writing about the aforementioned artists. For future reference, clips of previous presentations are available on YouTube in a link that will follow. These clips are from a class at Warren Wilson College in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Thank you for lending an ear and an eye.